We are in the third installment of our series about making the most of every opportunity. And we talk about God's word and God's declaration. And he said, I for I know my plan for you, plan to prosper you, not to harm you, and plan to give you a beautiful future, which is filled with hope. Amen? Amen. So we would like to refresh our minds about your destiny, your future. God has been there already, and He declared it. It is beautiful. Amen? You know, uh, can you tell that the person beside you, it, your future is beautiful. You are beautiful. Amen. Oh, Charlie, come on. You do not know what I'm going through today. You don't, you don't know my situation. It's been a challenge. It's been tough. It's been really, really difficult. And I don't want to diminish that. We don't want you to hallucinate of something and in a state of denial. But whatever your circumstance today, let me refresh your mind again to the Word of God. He said, there is hope. Amen. Tell it to the person behind you, there is hope! There is hope. Come on! Hallelujah! <laughs> Amen! Right? Do not be overcome by your negative, difficult, uh, uh, challenging situation and circumstance. There is hope! And we also talked about the second installment that, you know, if the Lord declared that my future is beautiful and there, there is hope waiting for me and there's always hope in my circumstance. You know, the challenge sometimes is, you know, uh, how do you claim it? How do you claim it? It's almost, uh, you know what, uh, we talk about always going for the best. Because sometimes it's like, it's like farming. Before you harvest, you cultivate the land, you plant the seed. Sometimes you need to do some kind of watering and fertilizing. And then sometimes you need to wait, right? And waiting is the hardest part. And pray that there will be no uh, hailstorm, right? Or in the Philippines, there should be no typhoon. And then the harvest comes. That's how you claim your future. You know? So always go for the best. Do not. As we, we illustrated in a picture last Sunday, do not die a chicken. <laughs> do not die a chicken. You are an eagle. You know, try to flip those wings, doing little things, being faithful to little blessings that God gave you, and be careful and be watchful of those daily routine that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, your daily routine you know, where it greatly impact your success. What you're going to do today will greatly impact what tomorrow will look like for you. Amen? Amen. That is just the law. What you planted, you will harvest. But sometimes the challenge is next. How do I know the best from the second best? Because you, Pastor Jared, is telling me, uh, according to the Word of God, you always go for the best. You deserve the best. God is the best. He wanted you to have the best. Whether it be in your life, in your career, in your family, in your ministry. Amen? He wanted you to be the best that you can be. And this is where the process of evaluation comes in. This is where... Uh, Asking the right question is very important. That's why today uh, we're going to be sharing to you a very important message. <coughs> you know, uh, grab a bulletin. Can I have my Twitter bottle, please? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, grab a pencil. There are uh, there is a message notes portion in your in your uh, there is a message portion notes in your uh, thank you in your uh, bulletin there. You know what? 
I observe bubbles whenever she prepares that book, that, that bulletin, it entails in her lots of time. So honor the ministry by using it and take it home with you, okay? Meditate with it. Challenge what will be presented today with your engagement with God through meditation through His words. So asking the right questions. <clears throat> Which opportunity is worth grabbing? Do you think this is worthy of your time this morning? Because we declare that we are surrounded with multiple opportunities. There are opportunities around us. And some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are best for us. So we wanted you to have the discernment to always go for the best and which opportunity is worth growing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, the Word of God says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is beneficial. Not everything is good for you. You're surrounded with lots of opportunities, probably, but not every opportunity is good for you. It may be good for the person beside you. It may be good for your neighbors. But it may not be the, the opportunity that is for you. Amen? Are you with me? I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Not everything is for the building up. So, this is where you need really to ask the right question. Which is which? Which is which? Which, is opportun which opportunity is good for me? Which, is, which opportunity is good for, for my family? Which opportunity is good for my career, for my future? Which, which opportunity is good for my ministry? Amen? Most of the time, we're surrounded with multiple opportunities, but we should learn to ignore what? The second best. You do not deserve that. You deserve better. Amen? Again, I like this exercise when you need to declare it to the person beside you. You deserve better. Come on. You deserve better. Your marriage deserve better. Your, your career deserve better. Your ministry deserve better. You know? Don't settle for like uh, the second best. Uh, recently, there is this uh, developing trend uh, amongst major companies in the world. Whether it be from uh, the Amazon.com or the, the, the Apple company or the Microsoft, all the companies, they have this uh, another way of brainstorming. And this is popularized by Hal Grigerson. Uh, one of the professors of the uh, European Institute of Business Administration. You can look online and this is an interesting development and trend. If you are an entrepreneur, if you are a businessman, if you are a young person trying to plan your career, if you are leading a ministry, the principle applies because at the end of the day these principles are taken, taken from the Word of God. They call this one catalytic questioning. And this, this is really about uh, engaging all your, if, if you own a company, say, say for example, if you own a company, they gather all their employers and staffs, staffers, and especially those who have uh, good minds, and bring them into a place where uh, they will invite everyone to ask the questions. Just asking questions. So they invite everyone, again, especially those of good minds, around a surface of paper. There's someone just writing down the questions, and the, and the whole exercise in catalytic questioning is just to ask questions. So everything should be in questions. Challenge everyone, ask questions, ask questions, and there's some, somebody writing all those questions. And at least they say, according to this exercise, not less than 75 questions. 
You know, receiving a suggestion that keep asking the body to ask questions until you're going to reach that level up until 75 to 250 questions. And out of those questions that were raised, pick at least four or five, four or five questions that you think will solve a problem, will make an impact. Questions that will have the highest impact in your life and the future of your company, of your career, in this case of your ministry. Questions that will effectively help you maximize your opportunities. This is what we call catalytic questioning. Actually, uh, in line with this, you know, uh, I would like to do this exercise in our ministry leadership. Catal catalytic questioning. Asking the right questions, sometimes the hard questions, sometimes which questions that you're afraid to ask because actually you don't want the answers. <laughs> Hallelujah! Selfies nowadays, you know selfies, right? To our uh, senior citizens who are not uh, netizens. This is a famous trend nowadays, you know? How many people are, uh, you know, are, are really into the selfies, you know? <laughs> you know, taking pictures of themselves or sometimes with themselves and others and their friends and families and, you know, all kinds of positions like, like this, like this, you know, like this, you know, and sometimes like this, you know? <laughs> Selfie is very popular, right? You know, sometimes people say, this is an opportunity, Pastor Charlie, to be, to have my claim a, a, a moment of pain. We post it on the internet and probably it will go viral and people will know an opportunity for me to be popular. So, I Google and look for the 10 deadliest Selfies ever. <laughs> Ten deadliest uh, selfies ever. Do you want to know it? I, I don't want to uh, post the, the tenth one. I only selected seven. And this is the first. <laughs> James Colette, 34, was on honeymoon. And according to the story, an hours away from flying back home, when the ocean pulled him, he just wanted to go for a quick dip, take a selfie underwater, and show off to his friends with this shark ready to strike him. <laughs> oh, this is my moment of an opportunity to be, to be popular. So when he saw the shark ready to strike him, time to have a selfie. <laughs> you know, you can read online. On the story went that, you know, the, the shark really strike him and uh, grab his legs and, and on the way to the hospital he lost so much quantity of blood and he died. Another one, this girl stood in a high place with this, you know, how many? 8.5 eight, eight, eight meter bridge with no safety harness. She fell. she fell. Of course, this is deadliest, right? So, in the name of something. Oh. Another one, an opportunity to escape. Come on, generally speaking, the nicest of animals. Justin and her boyfriend thought that, oh, come on. You know, and this happened. This one, he ran into the tornado. In the name of wanting to become popular, to have that selfie. This one <laughs> reminds me of a Joe movie. Right? Oh my goodness. This is another case in which if we didn't have smartphones and a constant need for a selfie, this moment would never have actually happened. How about this? Selfie with a cobra. She suffered a comatose. 
because he wanted to experience the chance to have the photo taken with a deadly snake. And the last one, <laughs> selfie with a tiger, right? A lion, I'm sorry. Thank you. You wanted to know the details? There is no detail. That is that probably dead. That's the only detail in all life. <laughs> Money, fame, personal 
our mission. That's what the enemy will tell give you. Is it? What he used to Jesus? I will give you this, I will give you this, I will give, we will give you the world. Jump and you will be popular. You know? Personal ambition. You know what? Worship. Jesus responded, no, that is not what life is all about. If there's one danger in North America nowadays, not only that the church is facing, but that North America is as well, is the danger of being trapped into materialism. And this really is a challenge, asking the right question. Is having millions in the bank, living in the biggest house in the city, and driving the newest model of a car, and being popular in the internet, is really that the purpose of life? Go home today and ask the question, what is my motivation? What drives me? What drives my ministry? What drives my family? Right to vision, God's love compels us, compels us to sacrifice and love for others that will lead us to service. These are good motivation. Lord, I love you. I want to do this for you. Lord, this is your greatest commandment, right? And then, how will this affect others? Because you should not be driven by selfish ambitions. The Bible says, for Christ's love compels us. Amen? Amen. I heard one member, uh, one leader of our church, he gave away his car uh, last, last week. And he told me, I love God and I want to show this my love for God by loving my brother. I can tell that he, need, he needs a car. It's like he gave him a car. How about that for Christ?
There will be opportunity around you. Will this honor God? Will this advance his agenda? Will this win souls? Number four, does this fit my purpose and calling? Because at the end of the day, God wanted you to honor him, advance his agenda, make disciples in a unique, exquisite way. He doesn't expect you to be like me. Are you with me? You are gifted differently. You are wired differently. Your giftedness is different from me. Sometimes we get distracted by saying, I wanted to make disciples, but I wanted the gifts of this pastor or this person or this vessel. No. You are great as you are. God made you unique. You're a masterpiece. There is giftedness. He deposited something in you, something special. If you use that faithfully and you honor God with a gifting, you will just do and great and fine. Amen? Amen. So don't be a copycat. Amen? 33% of the people. Hallelujah! Amen? The Bible says, no one, put, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God because sometimes we get distracted looking back, looking around. Oh, I, I would like to like it. My ministry, I, I, I wanted to copy his ministry. You know? I wanted, I wanted to move like he moves, right? I wanted to sing like he sings. I wanted to play instruments like he plays instruments. I wanted to pray like him. Well, you know, be unique. Amen? Because you are unique. <laughs> Let me tell you, and this is true. In the more, more or less 10, bill, 10 billion people in the universe, right, in, in, in the entire planet right now, there is no one like you. You can, you can look at your face in the mirror and you can declare with, with absolute certainty you are the only one among the billions. So for God's sake, love that face. Yeah. Hallelujah! I love, I praise the Lord for the way I am. Like David, sing it. Oh, praise the Lord for he wonderfully and marvelously created me in the womb of my mother. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This, distractions can come by trying to do what you are not gifted to do, trying to be somebody else, right? That's why you are, you are not happy with your ministry. You are not happy with your life. We are happy with your family. Oh, my, my neighbor, he wrote something like this. I want to talk like that. Oh, my classmates, you know, he can really do some things that I cannot do. I want to do like her. In the ministry, why is it that my ministry is grow, it's not growing and the ministry out there is growing? And you become jealous. You become anxious. You become what? This tour, and you have this? Can you use a turbulence within you and you do not have peace? How many of you realize that having a peace of mind, peace of mind, church, listen to this, peace of mind, according to the Bible, is this. this. You keep him in perfect peace. Perfect peace. I love the praise. Whose mind is staying focused on you. Because he trusts in you. Do not focus on others. Focus on honoring God. Focus on his agenda. Focus on winning souls. And focus on how he gifted you. Focus on what you can accomplish through you. And you will be happy. Hallelujah. The happiest people in the world are people who realize and accept the reality. Who they are. And they're excited to use whatever God deposited in their lives for the advancement of God's kingdom and his glory. Amen. Are you not happy with you? I'm happy just I am. Just. Um, you can dance. You can sing. You know? How great the heart. At the top of your voice, I don't care if my wife is not, you know, sometimes. Isn't it wonderful when, when, when your husband will tell you, you know, honey, I love you the way you are. Hallelujah. 
may be good, but it's a diversion. There's always opportunity. They're good, but it's diversion, destruction, and some a detour to God's purposes in your life. God wanted you to stay in the lane. Don't get distracted. Don't get diverted. Don't get detoured. This is my lane. This is my purpose. I will stay on my lane. I will run the race. The battle belongs to the Lord. The victory has been won. I'm more than conquerors. Declare this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's why I love the song, I am with thee. You need to stop fighting the battle that have been won already. Stay on the plane. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The danger of materialism. We're living in a world today. People think that money is everything. That's why in verse uh, uh, 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 19, I'll be just reading some of those bolded uh, let, uh, letter words. Yet through godliness we content that is itself a great wealth. That is God's purpose for us. To be contented on our lane. To stay on our lane. That is your lane. You know, that is your purpose. And the Bible says, so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be not, let us be content. Because sometimes then we want to do, hey, you know what? You need this. You need this. You need this. And you know, you cannot even rest, you cannot even you cannot even enjoy that. You cannot even you know what? Enjoy the, the sweet air of Alberta and enjoy the snow that is falling because I need to go to another road, I need to go to another road, I need to go to another road, and your high box is becoming bigger and bigger because you do not sleep and now you cannot think well and everything your wife will ask you, don't ask me a question, I'm tired. <laughs> so the, the relationship gets sour and then the children rebels and then the very purpose of why you work. What is that? At the instant, you ask the question, why do you work? I want to give the family a good future. And you ended up with a broken family. Be content. Tell the person beside you. Be content. <laughs> but people who long to the rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that blast them into ruin and destruction. So be careful. Careful, careful, church. It hit me. Sharp knife, Pastor Chaka. But it is the word of God. How many of us can really, really realize today that happiness and joy cannot be attended by having money? I heard a very, very empathic and testimony I will not forget just recently. My good friend and Pastor John, he told me, Pastor Charlie, one thing I observed. When you buy a newest model of car, you will be happy for three months. And after that, you know, the sorrows and the agonies begin. <laughs> you know, talk to Pastor John. Uh, that is his testimony. Right? Thank you, Pastor John, for the humility to accept that. Well, I'm not saying that do not buy a brand new car if you have the capacity, by all means buy. <coughs> but if you do not buy three, because you need, need one, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I can scratch my head. I visited some houses. Why don't you buy three? Brand new three. What is enough? Because I want, I want to have a car for spring. I want to have an issue for my family. I want to have a truck for my work. So I'm going to try three. <laughs> really justifiable. But who is the answer? The Bible says, tell them to use their money to do good. This, this is the meditation in the, our offering um, uh, uh, time this morning. And the Bible says, he should be rich in good works and generous to those in, in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be shared, storing up the priority, storing up treasure in heaven, a foundation for the future that they may be experienced. What is? True life. What? Let me tell you, church. Life here on earth is not true life. What God has for you is eternal life. And that life begins now. And it will be throughout eternity. Amen? Amen? So if you have eternal life with you, be happy. 
Uh, Sir John, I have eternal life. I have one car. I have a house. I have a home. I have lots of food in my friends. I have money in the bank. Be more happy. Some people just, oh, I have already. I want it to be a, a, a switch as Bill Gates. As Bill Gates. <laughs> oh, that's when you begin not to be happy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Seeking advice from knowledgeable people. I will close with this. So asking the right questions, knowing the facts before you decide, and lastly, seeking advice from knowledgeable people. The book of Proverbs says, plans go wrong with too few counselors. Many counselors bring success. Hallelujah! Many counselors bring success. So if you wanted to plunge into a new opportunity, into a new venture, whether it be starting a career, whether it be starting a business, whether it be starting a ministry, Ask people that are knowledge. Amen. Ask advice. Are you with me, church? Do not be afraid to ask advice. I, without mentioning uh, names, brother Sam shared to me a story, and I wanted to make it as general as possible so that this will not be a, a, a gossip. Uh, one of his friends started a restaurant business. And then, it should be a business that is focused on one ethnic group, Filipino ethnic group. So to help you understand, its market is Ilocano, so it should be Ilocano foods. So he plans to the opportunity, started the business, and after a few months, the business was closed. Why is that? How many people in Red Deer? 90,000. How many restaurants in Red Deer? How many Ilocanos in Red Deer? How many Ilocanos really love Ilocano food? So, church, whether it be in business, in your career, ask advice. If you wanted to become a nurse, ask the nurses. What does it mean to be a nurse? If you are uh, if you're planning to become a teacher, sit with someone who is uh, an experienced teacher. Please be a teacher. If you're starting a business, ask for successful entrepreneur to give you advice. Use every available information around you. If you're starting a ministry, ask successful ministers. The first thing I did when I joined ministry in Redeer is to visit churches. Who knows this? Stuart knows this. I visited the biggest church in Redeer with Stuart Fraser. Ask his advice. What do I need to know about Redeer? I visited Livingstone. I visited Board of Life. I visited most of the churches. Molenby. Ask them, bless me. Give me advice. I am new. Kid on the block. I'm not afraid to tell him, you know something that I do not know, that I wanted to know. Bless me with this knowledge. Be humble and God will exalt you. Amen. Where are you right now? Are you what, do you want to start something? A ministry? A career? Ask knowledgeable people. Successful people. What do I need to know and who knows it? The Bible says, without wise leadership, a nation is in trouble, but with good counsel and order is safety. Hallelujah. Praise God. What might be the un unintended consequences? The Bible says, a prudent man perceives the difficulties ahead and prepares for them, prepares for them. Hindi yung sigi-sigi lang. Come, the unintended consequences. How will this, how will this affect my family? How will this, be, how will this affect my ministry? How will this affect my prayer life? How will this affect my Bible study life? My disciple making life everything. What? Expect for the best and prepare for the worst. For the Bible says, a wise man is cautious and avoids danger. Amen. A fool marches ahead with great confidence. Are you a fool or are you a wise person? Avoid danger. So set. Sort select. It's your evil name. Amen. Now, the most important question you should ask. Is it really possible, Pastor Charlie, 
to ask the right question and receive the right answer. Or let me rephrase this. Is it really possible to ask the right question to the right person and receive the right answer and just respond in a wrong way? Again, is it possible to ask the right person, to ask the right question to the right person and receive a right answer and totally miss the opportunity? <laughs> well, it is possible. There was a young witch ruler and by the standard of the world, he might be viewed as a successful person. Young and is already a millionaire. Amen. Come on, church. The, the, the word of God says he's not, also, he's, he's not only rich, he is extremely rich. And to prove you the point that rich, however rich you are, that's, will not make you joy, will not make you happy. Happy. I'm sorry, will not make you happy. This is an extremely rich person, but there is something in him that is lacking. Because let me tell you, there, are, there is something in you, there is a, an emptiness in you that no material things in this world can fill. Not even a new car, a new house, money on the back, or a good job. Not, not that one can fill. This rich young ruler don't have eternal life in him. This rich young ruler do not have Jesus in him. Let me tell you, you might be the most wealthy person, successful person, most popular person on the face of the planet. But if you don't have Jesus, you are nothing. Do not one thing Jesus said. I look at your heart and it is filled with covetousness. The God in your heart is your money. I can see your heart. Are you kidding me? Lord, I obey all the commandments. I did this, I did this, I did this. But is the motivation correct? Let me tell you, let me expose the hypocrisy. If you truly love me, if you really wanted me, if you really, if you really wanted eternal life in him, would you not sell what to earn you are? Would you, would you give it away? Would you choose me? Would you allow me to sit on your on your back? Not your riches. Because Jesus can say in his heart, his God is money. And the Bible says, you cannot serve God in money. For you will love the one and hate the other. And you will despise the other and love the one. You cannot serve God in money. And in his heart, money is his God. Come on now, Jesus said, you don't want an eternal life. You need to give away everything. And this rich young woman, Turn his back to Jesus. And the only time in the scripture that a person encountered Jesus and left Saul. Everyone who encountered Jesus in the scripture, they met Jesus and they left with joy, with celebration, with happiness that can be described. But this person encountered Jesus and he left Saul. Because the Bible says he was very rich and he cannot give away his riches for the sake of eternal life. He asked the right question, asked the right person, and get the right answer. Got the right answer. But he responded very wrongly, and he missed the opportunity of spending eternity with God. He missed the opportunity that is the greatest opportunity that he can have. Jesus. You don't want to miss Jesus today. RJ, I don't know if you're a rich person. I don't know if you're a person that is not so rich. Rich and poor share the same need. The need for Jesus. 
You need Jesus today. Would you ask the question today, the most important question? What can I do to inherit eternal life? You don't want to do anything. It's a gift. Freely given. I wanted to give it to you right now. And if your heart is bursting with this decision, I wanted you to respond in the right way. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. And it will be more than enough. For the end of the day, when everything else failed, I want to challenge you right, Jesus. And you will have the peace, joy, and eternal life. Can I ask you to stand right now? You know Jesus, and Jesus is a beautiful friend.